Okay, you ready to hear a horrible story? Always, yes. Always. <laughs> okay. On the evening of August 10th, 1990, in Dickinson, Texas, a group of children were playing in an overgrown field when they accidentally stumbled upon the brutalized body of an eight-year-old girl. Miraculously, this girl was still alive, and she remembered almost everything that had happened to her. Welcome to Crime Soup Podcast. I'm your host, Hannah Kanapis. And I'm Kaylee. And today we'll be discussing the miraculous survival story of eight-year-old Jennifer Shewitt from Dickinson, Texas in 1990. Please be aware we will be discussing elements of child sexual abuse, although not in graphic detail, but please skip to another episode if you need to. On the evening of Thursday, August 9th, 1990, eight-year-old Jennifer Shewitt lay in bed with her mother Elaine at the Yorktown Apartments in Dickinson, Texas. However, as little kids often are, Jennifer was restless that night and kept accidentally kicking her mom in her sleep. Annoyed by this and needing to wake up in a few hours for work, Elaine told her daughter she needed to go back to her own bedroom that night about 2.30 a.m. Jennifer remembers returning to her bedroom that night, but instead of going back to sleep right away, she turned on her bedside lamp and fell asleep after reading some books. The next thing she remembered was waking up in the arms of a strange man as he ran with her down a sidewalk. She tried to scream, but he covered her nose and mouth with his hand. That's crazy that she didn't wake up during, like, leaving the house or anything. Was she drugged? Anyway, sorry. Continue. I mean, it was really early in the morning, so she was just sleepy. Also, like, think about when you were a kid. Your parents would just kind of scoop you up and move you around the house. That's true. And I'm usually sleepiest, like, super early in the morning like that, for whatever reason. Yeah. The strange man then placed Jennifer in his car and drove away with her on his lap telling her that everything was going to be okay and that he was an undercover police officer. Eventually, they pulled into a familiar location, the parking lot of her elementary school where Jennifer had just finished the second grade. They stayed parked in the parking lot for a while where the strange man told her to just watch the moon until her mom arrived to pick her up, but her mom never came. It was during these moments in his car that the strange man seemed obviously jittery and talkative, telling Jennifer that his name was Dennis, not realizing that this little girl was memorizing everything she could about his face, what he was saying, what was in his car, and where they were driving. Jennifer has said years later that this time spent in the parking lot of her elementary school seemed like Dennis was psyching himself up for what he intended to do to her. They then drove a couple blocks away, down a gravel road, and ended up at an overgrown field. This is when Dennis attempted to strangle her. Jennifer remembers blacking out only to regain consciousness as Dennis was dragging her by her ankles into the overgrown field. He dropped her legs, walked away, and she heard his car door slam shut before he drove away, leaving her in the dark field. She tried to scream for help, but no sound came out of her mouth. She tried to lift her head, but couldn't find the strength. She managed to throw her right hand up to her throat, which is when she felt the gaping wound in her neck. Dennis had slit her throat. But Jennifer didn't die. She remembers the sun coming up that day, and the clouds moving in the sky as she lay in that field, feeling powerless, not able to scream for help. She drifted in and out of consciousness as more and more blood drained from her little 45-pound body, surprised each time that she woke up and found that she hadn't died yet. She remembers ants crawling all over her body and painfully biting her. The most torturous part of her experience, however, was that she was close enough to the road that she could see cars coming and going nearby, 
but she couldn't get their attention in any way. Back at her apartment, Jennifer's mother awoke about 7.30 a.m. to find her daughter missing and Jennifer's bedroom window ajar, and she contacted the police. While police were the ones tasked with finding Jennifer, it was actually a group of children that accidentally stumbled upon her in the field. Jennifer laid powerless in that overgrown field for 14 hours. The sun was beginning to go down again when she felt somebody run into her foot. Some children had been playing a game of tag when one of them found her. She was life flighted to John Seeley Hospital in Galveston, Texas, and immediately underwent surgery for the slash in her neck. The laceration went through her trachea but hadn't severed any major blood vessels, which is how she was able to survive. Doctors noted that in addition to the laceration in Jennifer's neck, she also had trauma to her face and had been sexually assaulted. A lot of the blood vessels in her eyes had broken from the multiple times Dennis had attempted to strangle her. Only a quarter mile away from where Jennifer was found, police canvassing the area found some of Jennifer and the perpetrator's clothing in a ditch. Forensic DNA technology was still in its infancy in 1990, but police were aware that this clothing could potentially be tested and lead them to a suspect, so it was saved. Back at the hospital, Jennifer did everything she could to tell police about the man who had kidnapped her. But since she couldn't talk, she had to write everything down and try to communicate as best she could. Four days after her arrival at the hospital, Jennifer met with a sketch artist to hopefully help police get an idea of what this strange man looked like. She told them he looked greasy with what looked like a scar on his face, perhaps a smudge of grease. He had dark hair and a mustache. In addition to the composite sketch, after Jennifer regained her voice six days after surgery, she also described the man's car, including a rusted dent on the side of it. She described the beer cans in the cab and the packages of cigarettes he smoked. Despite all of this detailed information that Jennifer was able to describe, her case went cold. She returned back to school that fall, started the third grade, and tried to live a normal life. But she never gave up trying to find the man who'd attacked her. Wait, wait. She told the police this guy's name? <laughs> and they couldn't find him? Yeah. That seems fucking insane. <laughs> it's gonna get even crazier, but yeah. So she provided a composite sketch that she felt very certain about. Um, how much they trusted her, I don't know, because she was only eight years old, but she said that the composite sketch was accurate, she described his car, she described the dent in it, she knew what kind of beer he drank, what the inside of his car looked like, what his face looked like, what he was wearing, what cigarettes he smoked. <laughs> this is insanely detailed information. I, and what town of Texas is this in? Dickinson? Is this like a small town? Yeah, it has to Not be. Not one fucker named Dennis. <laughs> that, that they could have looked into. That just feels weird to me. That feels, I don't, maybe I'm missing something, but that feels straight up lazy to me. Because what the hell? I don't care yeah. if you don't trust her. You look into it. <laughs> yeah, just, just wait. Hold on. I'm going to tell you more. <laughs> Good God. So years went by and Jennifer graduated high school. She got married. Meanwhile, her case continued to get passed down to new detectives, and it remained unsolved for almost 20 years. Insane. It wasn't until a very determined detective named Tim Cromey was assigned to Jennifer's case, who got the FBI involved, that headway was finally made. And when I say that he was, like, especially determined, I mean he was just doing his job. Yeah. That's exactly what it sounds like. I was about to yeah. say, determined or just like a guy actually doing what he's supposed to do? Yeah. Why wasn't the FBI involved sooner? This is literally the kidnapping, sexual assault, and attempted murder of a child. Yeah. Is that not terrifying enough to get the FBI involved? Well, the FBI was involved in the beginning as well. It just didn't go anywhere. And Hate I think... It. After it went cold, the FBI wasn't involved anymore. It was just like local detectives and it just kept getting passed down as people changed jobs. Yeah. But finally, like 18 years after her attempted murder, there was a detective who called her up, sat her down and said, 
I'm going to find this guy. I think we have enough that we can find this guy. Well, thank God there's one guy in every 20 years who can do this. That makes me feel good. <laughs> Detective Croby and FBI agent Richard Renison submitted some of the clothing found near the crime scene to a government lab at Quantico for DNA testing, and the clothing came back positively matched to a known felon named Dennis Earl Bradford. <laughs> Shut the fuck up. Oh, oh my God. <laughs> they literally could have like typed the name Dennis into their fucking database. <laughs> Been like, hmm, there are 12 Dennises here. Maybe we should look at all of them. Maybe we should talk to them. Oh, literally, this is, this is laziness. I. She gave them his exact name. What's crazy is that he told her his name. People have been found with less information. This is why... Women should be in charge of these things. Truly and fucking honestly, women wouldn't even need a first name. <laughs> I am so confident that any woman off the street wouldn't need a first name. They'd be able to find this guy. Especially in a small <laughs> town. In a small town. Come on. After they get a positive match from his DNA, they find out that this guy had served time in prison. For a very similar crime, it wasn't a child, but he went to prison for kidnapping and sexually assaulting a woman that he met at a bar in Hot Springs, Arkansas, seven years after Jennifer's case, so 1997. And at the time of this DNA match, which happened in 2009, Dennis was living a completely and seemingly normal life in Arkansas. He was 40 years old and he was married he was like a family man and had three stepsons. But when they look into his past, they discover that he hadn't always been in Arkansas. They see that he had actually been living in Dickinson, Texas at the time of Jennifer's abduction. And that he actually had two listed residences, both that were very close to the apartment complex that Jennifer shared with her mom in August of 1990. Oh my fucking god. Okay, like hold 12 on. A 12-year-old could have done this. A 12-year-old this... could have solved this case. Mary Kate and Ashley Olsen could have solved this. Do not disrespect them. Obviously, they could have solved this, first of all. <laughs> no, like, no question. Ever... <laughs> <laughs> yes. I'm talking about, do you remember that movie that they were in where they were, like, detect, like, Yes, sloops? exactly. Yeah. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. They were better at this from the get-go than any of the detectives <laughs> on this case initially. They are the professionals. Okay, why didn't we have them on this case? They weren't alive yet, were they? 1990? They were probably alive. They're, they were just they're a few years older. They're, they were born in the 80s. Oh, they were? Okay. Yeah, they could have solved this then. They were certified sleuths probably by 1990. Probably. Like, what? Okay, Kaylee, it gets worse, though. <laughs> just... How can it get worse? Because I don't understand. Somebody is intentionally not giving a shit is what I'm <laughs> getting from this. There's no way that any of these men on the case did their job. I'm, like, there has to be, like, gross negligence in this somewhere. Like, like intentionally. Okay, tell me how it gets worse. So, what's more, when police looked up his driver's license that, like, his photo ID that he would have had in 1990 whenever it occurred, it was basically identical to the composite sketch that Jennifer had helped develop only four days after her attempted murder. And when I say identical, I mean, it literally looks like if you handed an artist this guy's ID and said, hey, can you draw this guy's face? That's what it looked like. It was identical, like insane. I'm kicking the wall right now. I'm legitimately kicking the wall. I Can I send you the picture? Please do. I need to see. Um, he looks kind of like Freddie Mercury from the early 90s. Well, that's devastating. Hold on. Let me find it. But that is the first uh, thing that I thought of when you said dark hair and a mustache. <laughs> is Freddie Mercury? Yeah. I was like, oh, Freddie. Okay. <laughs> You're going to shit your pants. <laughs> oh, my fucking God. <laughs> Are you seeing this? It's uncanny. Like, it's an exact match. Like, the... <laughs> There's there's no misinterpreting the composite sketch, right? It's just... And you know what's crazy is that I've literally never seen a better composite sketch in my life. Never in my entire life. Usually something is off, right? Yes. Like, even 
in the fucking case about um oh my god what's her name the female serial killer we just did eileen wernos eileen hers wernos. Was bad. hers hers was bad and people were still like oh yeah i know that bitch what first of all i didn't recognize the her from the composite sketch like at all like if you showed me that and i had known eileen i would have been like i have no idea who that even if you is. knew her yeah i yeah i would have no idea i'd be like i do not know a woman who looks like that i'm sorry but this this is so identical that it's not, it's actually not even laughable like i shouldn't be laughing because it's so spot on it's insane like the exact mustache shape the exact chin stubble the, the exact, exact face shape which is crazy face shape hair length eyebrow shape eye shape he even has kind of crooked ears <laughs> uh, there isn't any way that i they failed this little girl yeah i would be so I- insanely angry if this happened to my child and this all came out later and and i'm like oh so i could have fucking solved this case are you fucking kidding me I could have taken justice into my own hands. This just drives me insane because what more did they need? They They literally had everything on a silver platter is what they had. Everything. They had everything handed to them. She was like, this is what he looks like exactly. This is the kind of car he had. I think when they asked her about his age, she was off. But also at eight years old, I also probably couldn't give you an accurate age of adults. No, because a 25 year old would have looked 40 to me. And yes, and so she told them that he looked between 28 and 38 years old, and he was actually only 20, which 20-year-olds look ancient whenever you're 8 years old. Yes. Not to mention he had, like, facial hair, and he had chest hair, and so he probably looked And he looked more greasy, manly. apparently, so. Yeah. Grease adds years. <laughs> also, people didn't moisturize in the 90s. Men don't moisturize now. <laughs> This is a lesson, everybody. Do you want to look 20 (laughs) or do you want to look 38 to 40? (laughs) The difference is moisturizer and taking showers. So police, when police finally confronted Dennis Bradford, Dennis didn't really try to hide the information. So it's been almost 20 years. They confront him and he admits that he knew Jennifer Shewitt. And initially he refuses to provide any other details because... It seems like he's really ashamed of what he did. Like, he doesn't want to talk about it. He's not one of those murderers that, like, wants to gloat about it. He's one that, like, knew it was wrong and has spent his whole life thinking about it kind of thing. Mm, He didn't know it was wrong enough to stop doing it at any point, but... Yeah. (laughs) But he eventually came clean. So Dennis was only 20 years old at the time of Jennifer's abduction, and he claims that on that night... And this is a very vague description, but this is all he says. He says he was out driving. Why he was out driving at like three in the morning, he doesn't say. He says he was just randomly out driving. He doesn't know what brought him to her apartment complex. But he claims that he saw the lamp shining from her bedroom window. She had a giant, really bright lamp. She said that she loved as a kid. It was shaped like a giant light bulb. And that's the lamp that she was reading her books by. But at this point, she had already fallen asleep. She was afraid of the dark, and so she often slept with the lamp on. Dennis claims that when he went to go peer in the window to see the source of the light, he saw her lying in bed asleep, and he doesn't know why. This is what he says, right? He doesn't know why he decided to take her, but her window was, he claims, ajar, which... I guess it's possible in Texas in August, maybe her window was cracked open because it was hot. But he claims that he just let himself in and abducted her. And then the rest of the story is history, right? First of all, I don't go looking into random people's windows. First of all, I'm not out at three in the morning because (laughs) I'm sleeping. So (laughs) secondly, if I am out late or early, I don't go looking into people's windows. Like who the fuck does that? I don't think normal people do that. People with no intention of hurting people or being creepy do that. So he can shove that where the sun don't shine. And I don't let myself into people's windows that are ajar as well. Because I'm not even at the base of their windows in the first place. So 
this was a terrible excuse. I think we all know exactly why he did it, and it's because he's a fucking creep and a pervert. Well, Kaylee, if you're not breaking into people's houses, what do you do for fun? <laughs> I'm just a boring bitch, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> like, I just got boring hobbies. <laughs> okay, but also when he's recounting his side of the story, because up, up until this, I've just told you her version, right? Yeah. His version is basically identical. And he even says that he tried to calm her down by telling her he was a police officer, which is what she said. Mm-hmm. So her recount, her, how do you say that? Recantation? Recantation? Yeah. Recantation? Yeah. Her version of events, spot on. Basically, everything that Jennifer told investigators about this man turned out to be true, including his exact first name, what he looked like, what his car looked like, what beer he drank, and what cigarettes he smoked. And her case still went cold for almost two decades. He lived near her home. Police had a perfect description of his name, face, and car, but none of the tips that came into police went anywhere. And I looked up the newspaper from the time, because I at first I was like, did they just never publish it? That doesn't make sense. So I looked it up. They published it. It was in the newspapers. And like, like I said before, she got his age wrong and said he was much older, but... You know what I couldn't find in any of the published articles about the case? Nowhere did it say Dennis. So she told investigators that the man had told her his name was Dennis. And I might be wrong, but out of everything that I could find online and reading the old newspapers, nowhere does it say the police are looking for a man, a man even potentially named Dennis. Like, I don't know why they wouldn't include that. Do you? The only reason in my mind that they wouldn't include it is because they wanted to keep their horizons open. But I think that's a bullshit response to that because they should have kept that avenue open to say, if you know this man or a man that goes by the name Dennis that vaguely resembles this man please call us because that would open a lot of a lot more doors <laughs> like did they just yeah like maybe they just want to keep the doors opening be like well you know we just want to put out the picture here's the thing because though, is af after a certain amount of time in some investigations i've seen where police they'll release a little bit of information at first like just the basics and then when it doesn't go anywhere they'll release more hoping that it'll jog people's memories i just think that they didn't want to release the name because they were assuming that he probably gave her a fake name, number mm -hmm. one, and that they didn't want people to look at the picture and be like, I know a guy that looks like that, but his name ain't Dennis. So yeah. not going to yeah. call in. But I think that's, I think that might be underestimating the general public, but I don't know, after dealing with the general public, maybe not. But either way. But couldn't they just say like, might potentially go by yes. the name Dennis? Like, even if you just don't say like, his name is Dennis, but just potentially his name is Dennis. Wouldn't I think that, be that would have been super the right helpful? thing. I think that would have been the right thing to do, personally. And also, what I am desperate to know the, the percentage of crimes actually solved by this police department, because I'm sure it was close <laughs> to 0%. If they had all of this information, which is basically the best case scenario, the best you can possibly hope for is everything that she gave them, Right. Like, mm -hmm. in most cases, you get less information than that. In most cases, you don't even get a fraction of that information. And cases can still be solved with less information, with lots less information than what she gave them. So their rate of solving crimes was probably in the negatives, actually. Because there's no fucking way they got all of this information and they did nothing with it. I don't understand how this wasn't like a huge fucking deal. Because this case literally sounds like something that would come in a box as like those catch a killer boxes. Yes. That like gives you all of the important information and it's just like a fun party game and everyone ends up solving it. Yes. Yeah. Did Jennifer end up suing the police department? I don't think so. Because I mean, they did eventually solve it. But let me tell you how it ends. They arrest Dennis Bradford. He makes a confession. He was arrested in October of 2009 for the rape and attempted murder of eight-year-old Jennifer Shewitt. 
but she never got the chance to face him in court because he hung himself in jail while waiting trial. That's unfortunate. Yeah. So she got very little closure out of it. And actually, one of her biggest advocates was her grandfather. And he died, like, earlier that year before they caught him. So oh, he waited, sad. like, 20 years. And apparently, he would go into the police station, like, once a month to try and get updates and, like, put a fire under their butts about his granddaughter's case. And then they finally solved it, like, months after he died. And I'm like... That's so sad. I hate everything about this fucking case. I just do not understand. I really don't. This seems insane. They did not put their whole police sussy into this. No, they eventually solved it. Do you want to hear her victim impact statement? Yeah, is it going to make me cry? So obviously, Jennifer was really upset. In fact, after Dennis Bradford was incarcerated and he was put in jail, she specifically told the police, like, do not let him kill himself. Mm -hmm. And they couldn't even do that. So 20 years to the day after her abduction on August 10th, 2010, she went to Dennis Bradford's grave and she read him her impact statement. So through tears, she said to him, Dennis Bradford, I waited 19 years, two months and three days to find out your last name and for you to be caught. You chose the wrong little 45-pound eight-year-old girl to try and murder because for 19 years I've thought of you every single day and helped in searching for you. In my heart, I knew you were out there, alive, either in prison or living a lie, and now, I know listening to my heart all of these years, and never giving up on finding you, I was right. How validating must that have been to, like, you just know, like, she knew in her heart that he was still out there, she knew his name was Dennis, she knew what she saw, she knew what he looked like, how frustrating it would have been for her that she knew all those details and seemingly did everything right to aid the investigation and it went nowhere for almost two decades. But imagine at the end finding out like, yes, his name was Dennis and yes, this is exactly what he looked like and yes, he lived right down the road from me and now I know his last name and it's case closed but she never got to face him in court. I don't know. That's upsetting to me. It's extremely upsetting. And I and I think for me personally that would drive me I like I, I would need to go back to therapy therapy if I wasn't in it already because it would feel like nobody fought for me if I were in Jennifer's yeah. shoes. It would feel like nobody nobody cared enough to really fight for me because all of the information that I gave them was spot on. It literally just came down to some DNA testing. Like the, <laughs> And that's lazy work, honestly, because number one, they had DNA testing in 1990, although it wasn't awesome. They had it much before 2009 when they finally yes. sent it in, though. Yeah. They could have solved it with, with just by DNA alone in the next couple years. Well, they, they finally got around to it in 2009 because I guess they got a grant. So, like, there's a uh. lot of cases that could probably be solved right now and police know that they could be solved right now it's just a matter of funding because police departments don't have enough money to submit dna testing for every single case where there's dna present right but i mean this is a huge case this is the kidnapping rape and attempted murder of a little child this should be the highest priority of any department yeah and if they had been able to do their jobs a little bit better and find a suspect, then the FBI probably could have gotten them a grant or even just sent off the DNA testing themselves on their own dime because the case had been promising enough to do so, right? Like that, it seems like nobody really did their jobs. This was upsetting. I don't know how to end this on a happy note. Thank you for joining us at Crime S Thank you for joining us at Crime Soup today. Uh, we hope you enjoyed this story. <laughs> I didn't, for one, personally. No, honestly, it was not here for your enjoyment. It was here uh, to ruin your day, just like always. To make you angry. If you're listening to this podcast hoping that it's going to improve your day, I'm sorry to say that that's probably not the case. We're trying to radicalize you. <laughs> Shh, Kaylee, don't tell them that. <laughs> but if you'd like to tune in next Tuesday, we're going to have an all new story. Crime Soup is also on social media. You can find us on TikTok, 
Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, you name it. We also have a website, crimesouppodcast.com, where you can buy Crime Soup merch. And you can also listen to all of our past episodes. Again, we'll see you next Tuesday. Stay safe and bon appetit.